this is a great pleasure for me to introduce Kostas Glinos. Uh, he is currently working at the European Commission, where he leads the unit in charge of open science and the Director General of Research and Innovation since June 1st, 2019. Between 2014 and 2019, he led the unit responsible for EU international cooperation policy in SITI, Science and Technology and Innovation, and for relation with European economic area countries, Switzerland, Russia, Western Balkans, Tur Turkey, all of Asia, Australia, and New Zealand. Uh, Kostas has been developing EU policies and managing R&D programs in the area of science, technology, and innovation in Brussels since 1991. Policy areas that he dealt with include open science and innovation, collaboration in research, industry-academic interaction, the governance of uh, uh, research commons, public-private partnership, sin uh, science diplomacy, and international cooperation policy at bilateral and bioregional levels. Costa's work at the chemical industry in the United States and Belgium, lectured at the university and carried out research in Greece. He holds a PhD in engineering from the University of Massachusetts, an advanced professional certificate in investment management from Dexter University in the United States. Uh, it is my great pleasure to give the virtual floor to, to you, Costa. But before that, I remind you that you can ask questions via chat. Please write them down in English. Uh, if you are ready, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, thank you for the invitation. I'm very glad to be with you today to present you the uh, Open Science Policy. Um, there are some slides that were already put up earlier on. Right. So uh, I'll try to cover the uh, bulk of open science policies in, uh, in this presentation. Next slide, please. Next slide. So, first of all, some definitions and uh, justifications. What is open science? What do we call open science? We call open science a new paradigm in the way that we are doing research. Uh, it is a way in which uh, knowledge, data, tools are shared uh, as early as possible within the research process. Um, the, there is some echo is it for me or uh, i don't i'm not sure because i hear quite loud um, uh, an echo on my um, on my earphones i don't know if it's just me or it's a general issue it was not there before with um, johan okay it, it has stopped now um so it is it is a way so therefore it's a way of doing research it is not uh, sharing the product of the research is not like finishing a research project and then publishing uh, what you found in the research or publishing uh, the uh, your data or your methods. It is sharing it while research is going on. So if you want, it is the digital transformation of research. The, imp the introduction of uh, digital technologies has transformed our uh, industry, our economies, our societies. It is It has changed entirely many sectors like uh, media, for example, or like commerce or uh, entertainment and so on. Uh, it hasn't changed science radically yet. So, of course, it has accelerated science. It has, uh, our scientists use daily digital tools, but the process of science is still at the beginning of being reformed. And when, as we know from other sectors, uh, the um, in order to take advantage really of the digital technologies, you don't need just to apply the old process uh, with the new tools, but finally the process itself is becoming reformed and becomes far more um, generally far more efficient. There can be also significant drawbacks. So why um, are we accelerating the change? Because we think that open science uh, will increase the uh, quality and I'll give an example in a second, the efficiency of a research and innovation, as well as its creativity, the productivity. Uh, and it will increase the trust in the science system on behalf of society. Uh, so when we're talking about openness, we're talking about openness between all relevant knowledge actors. So openness between researchers, 
openness between disciplines, which is far more difficult because they very often they don't speak the same language. They don't have the same kind of formats, standards for annotating their data, for instance. There are all sorts of practical issues. And we're talking also about openness between science or scientists and citizens or society as a whole. So openness uh, across the board. We believe that open science is better science. That's why we promote it. It is not just for the sake of promoting it. But it is, we really believe that we, uh, we, it will lead to far better, more productive, more efficient science. Next one. So what concretely are the areas we are currently dealing with in open science? I can classify them in two categories, the practices of open science and the enablers of open science. So in the practices, you will find the, uh, what you already probably know or practice like open access to publications, of which Johan gave you uh, a very um, a detailed, elaborate um, uh, view on behalf of Coalition S. Uh, we're talking about the sharing of uh, research data, but also all other research outputs, like software, like algorithms. In some communities, they share lab books, for example, uh, or uh, any, anything else, uh, models, for instance, in the climate area, it is extremely important to share the computer models that are being used. Uh, it is about uh, making all your outputs and all your data fair, meaning findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable, because it's not enough to open them up. People have to be, to, uh, have, uh, to be able to find them. And then once they find them, they have to be able to access them, or if they're not accessible, know, if they're not open, know what are the conditions of access. They have to be interoperable, they have to be reusable. So reusable, especially regarding licensing, uh, they need to have these outputs clear licenses uh, so that they can be uh, reused. They need to be reproducible. It's an area that receives a more, more and more importance. Uh, I'll, I'll come to it in a second. And we're talking about the um, another practice, societal engagement and responsibility. And this has several aspects. Uh, one is to involve citizens uh, or civil society organizations in the definition of research objectives or the definition of uh, programs, research programs. Another aspect is to involve them in doing the research itself. So what we commonly call the citizen science. There is also science communication that has to do with uh, uh, the, uh, the um, uh, an increasing feeling of responsibility of uh, academics and researchers to explain to society what they are doing and why uh, they, what they are doing is valuable for society. So these are the typical practices of, uh, of uh, open science, um, but to exercise those successfully, one needs a number of conditions and um, and the uh, and probably the um, a very important one is and I'll come to this also in a second is the rewards and incentive structure. So people will not at least not fully exercise open science for as long as they are not rewarded for it. It's completely normal. Uh, we need the appropriate skills and education, both uh, at uh, academic and research level as well as at the support staff and the um, technical and administration staff of universities and other uh, research establishments. And we need, finally, the infrastructures to support this openness. And one example is uh, of this infrastructure is the European Open Science Cloud uh, that, um, uh, that, that will support this transition uh, to open science. For example, uh, you can um, uh, try to have all your data fair. You can, be, uh, you can try to be very good at uh, managing your data or your other outputs. If uh, it's, you don't have a repository where to put them, and, or if this repository is not well connected or interoperable with other repositories across Europe or the world, then it makes your life very difficult. That's why you need the infrastructures to support. Next slide, please. So let me bring an example on reproducibility that I said earlier, that I mentioned earlier. It's one aspect of quality. Reproducibility means the reproducibility of research results. In other words, the possibility for other scientists to take 
the results published, let's say, in a, in a publication, and use your uh, data sets or your tools or your software and uh, come up with uh, more or less the same conclusions, the same results, so whether these results can be reproduced. Obviously, this is a very important uh, characteristic of quality, uh, but um, maybe uh, many of you have heard or have been reading the, um, the scientific press that many people talk about the reproducibility crisis for the last five, ten years. Uh, I don't like, we don't like to call it a crisis. I don't, don't think it's a crisis really, but it is a challenge. Uh, in uh, their papers, uh, and uh, the, this is a relatively old slide, so the papers are um, quite old, but there are papers uh, uh, demonstrating that, for example, in the health research area, which is a very large area, we spend worldwide, globally, about 300 billion euros per year, that as much as 85% of it, depending on the area, is not reproducible, which means not trusted. It's not research that other scientists can build on its results, so which is tremendous, of course, and uh, it is something that needs a tremendous waste of resources and needs to be correct. Now, if you look at the reasons, many of these have to do with transparency and openness. Uh, for example, uh, in uh, the um, in some cases, you have research reports that are not uh, usable because the methods uh, are not available, the codes are not available. Uh, the issues of um, uh, cognitive bias are uh, very important on behalf of researchers. In many cases, people repeat studies because the results of the previous studies were not fully accessible, and therefore they do not know, the, uh, the scientists repeating, that this was tried and didn't lead anywhere because there is this publication bias and people do not publish unsuccessful results. In other words, let's say you collect, you, you spend months collecting data and data sent, you spend quite a bit of money, but then this doesn't lead somewhere that it is, uh, that it is very uh, appealing. And therefore this is never published, this is never known. So other scientists are condemned to repeat it. Uh, and, and then also waste their time by coming up with, uh, you know, dead ends. Very often we have study designs that uh, that are not that are not appropriate and so on. So uh, this is um, this is one example in which uh, research quality can be uh, significantly improved by um, by uh, openness uh, in all its aspects, as I described it earlier. And this is uh, increasing uh, its importance is increasing uh, worldwide. I was in the last three days in the UNESCO meeting. Uh, on uh, the UNESCO recommendation on open science, and uh, I was uh, was impressed to see that reproducibility was discussed among the delegates of 160 countries, and it has made uh, has made its entry in the um, in the future UNESCO uh, recommendation. It is something also that we have been discussing with uh, with colleagues in, uh, of course, within the European Union, but also outside, including the United States. Next slide, please. Now, open science has been discussed a lot in the last year. It has increased prominence uh, because of COVID-19. Because everybody uh, says, uh, I mean, COVID-19 is an emergency. We need to accelerate research in vaccines, in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, finding treatments, in, uh, no, in, uh, and so on, uh, therapeutics. Uh, therefore, everything needs to be open very quickly. And this is a mixed uh, result because uh, the, um, uh, a, year, um, a year and a half ago, uh, sorry, no, it was uh, in February last, last year, we had a meeting of uh, 16 uh, chief science advisors of states around the world. Uh, and uh, they, um, they had this declaration where they asked publishers to open up all their content uh, related to COVID-19. Then this group of people was of countries was joined up by, by other countries. The, um, the publishing industry responded and in fact they opened all contact, all uh, content, the content that was closed and that's related to COVID-19 temporarily. So that was, a, that was a good success in the sense also demonstrating that open science when there's a crisis, uh, it is, becomes essential. Uh, in the graph on the right hand side, I show you also the um, progress in preprints. So preprints is a way to share your results rapidly. 
uh, and um, uh, you see that the slope of the curve in the last couple of years has been uh, increasing. So now we have a, a, a preprint standing at uh, more than 6%. It's still a low number, but with COVID-19, this, this increase in slope is due to COVID-19 related papers. In the first nine months of 2020, we had 192,000 uh, preprints uh, which is uh, to compare with uh, 226,000 for the full duration of 2020. So we had uh, some increase, some significant increase, but still preprints is a quite low uh, number compared to the overall number of publications as, as you see the, uh, in the picture. On the other hand, if you go and look at the publications themselves and to what extent is, are the data sets open supporting these publications, um, this has not increased. Um, the, the, we don't see an increase in slope in the improvement of this. So uh, the COVID-19 has not, not at least in a significant way, convinced the researchers that they should open, share their data more. Uh, and then, um, as we very well know, because we have been, um, we have been um, uh, working very hard in the last uh, more than a year to bring together the European COVID-19 data research data platform, uh, interoperability of research data is a major obstacle. So uh, if, the, if you want to bring together genomic data of the virus with genomic data of the host and with prote other proteomic data and with clinical data is a major challenge. Interoperability is, is, is really a major challenge. We'll be organizing uh, a workshop in Portugal under the Portuguese presidency on the uh, uh, on the 7th of June to discuss this issue. Next slide, please. So let me now uh, go to, um, to uh, after this uh, general introduction, to the ERA communication, which is a communication the Commission published on 30th September last year, and uh, that um, it is about a new ERA and a new European research area for research innovation. Uh, and this uh, has several, uh, has four axes, four dimensions. One of them is deepening the European research area. And in the deepening part, there is, uh, 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 there is a significant part devoted to open science. And, the, um, and, this, and this part has the um, uh, four actions that are foreseen, of which I will be talking in a second. Uh, the one is about launching a new publication platform of peer-reviewed open access publishing. This is the kind of diamond publishing, if you want, that I think Johan also talked about earlier on. A second action is to analyze copyright, author's rights for scientific publications in order to see what differences do we have across European member states and whether the legal environment is appropriate uh, for uh, open access to publications. And if not, what can we do to improve it? A third action is to uh, continue building the European Open Science Cloud so that it's an infrastructure supporting data and other uh, digital objects like software and so on uh, to make them uh, access, to make them fair. I will not be talking about it today because I, uh, I, it's a separate talk on its own right. And fourthly, uh, it is to incentivize another action, another action, uh, open science practices by improving, reforming the research assessment system. There are also a number of actions related to open science in another chapter of the uh, communication, which is called citizen engagement, and uh, that uh, have to do with uh, uh, Europe-wide citizen science campaigns, uh, crowdsourcing platforms to use the, the uh, to, to, to access amateur scientists, uh, pan-European hackathons, uh, and mostly all of these in the context of European, of Horizon Europe missions. Um, there is a Plastic Pirates, um, uh, the uh, citizen science campaign that will be, uh, that is being launched now and that connects to the Clean Oceans uh, uh, mission. Next slide, please. Okay, so let me take the, um, give you uh, a few news, let's say, about this new publication venue. So the Commission is launching uh, a publication platform, so a journal, if you wish, uh, which will be open to all beneficiaries 
uh, of Horizon 2020 and Horizon Europe in the future. Uh, you will be able to publish the if uh, just one of the authors of the paper has been uh, a beneficiary and uh, if this is an outcome of the, um, uh, to some extent at least, of an Horizon uh, project. Why uh, are we doing this? It's a peer review. It's a peer review venue, obviously. Uh, why are we doing this? Uh, we are doing this uh, firstly to offer a service to our scientists, to our researchers, to the researchers we are funding. Uh, in a, a service that means that they don't need to worry about open access by publishing in this journal, automatically their contractual obligations are fulfilled because the journal is made such that it is it 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 um, supports it complies with all the um, uh, uh, Horizon Europe and Horizon 2020 in the past uh, uh, conditions. Uh, but we are also uh, doing it to give a, a good example to walk the talk, as they say, of our open science policy, because it will exemplify what we believe are the good pra practices in publishing uh, regarding, for example, uh, open peer review. So peer review in this journal will be open, so the names of the reviewers will be known, the review reports will be known, and one will be able to cite the review reports. So the, um, the, the review reports uh, become citable documents in their own right. A very good report can be referenced by others later on as if it was a kind of a paper. It will be connected, of course, to what the paper it reviewed. Uh, and there can be discussion on the platform about the reviews, the, which they never stop, the reviews. So, I mean, even two years later, you can continue reviewing. Of course, you need once uh, once the um, the paper receives the positive reviews, it will uh, take the label of a peer-reviewed uh, publication if it passes, of course, this uh, this test. Uh, so uh, the other reason we're doing this is to show this model of diamond publishing, if you want. Uh, in other words, where funders or public authorities take the initiative of uh, of, um, of putting forward uh, journals uh, or platforms of this type, it will cover all. Uh, disciplines that are uh, so any discipline whether it is humanities social sciences or physics or whatever so uh, it will have structured this um, to uh, to to be completely to cover to cover everything uh, next slide please uh, okay I have talked already about a number of these things we are helped uh, greatly by an expert uh, scientific advisory board that um, is uh, that uh, guides our uh, decisions, our actions, uh, and yes, something that I forgot to say is that this will be a free of charge uh, service to beneficiaries. So it will not cost. I mean, we cover the commission covers all the costs. Uh, there is uh, there is no, there is no cost to the uh, authors. It is fully optional, of course. So you can still publish anywhere you want, but it is just another option you have as a as a scientist uh, funded by Horizon Europe uh, to to publish here, uh, of course it is um, it will have uh, made a contract uh, with F1000 Research uh, to operate the service for us. Next slide, please. Okay, this was launched on the 24th of March, so uh, quite recently. We have now uh, 125 articles that have been submitted. Uh, of those, 46 are, uh, are published. You can see them on the site, and five have passed peer review. Uh, there is one, my colleagues put one for me, uh, there's one where uh, Polish researchers are actually involved uh, in the first article that you see there on the, on the right hand of my slide. Next slide, please. So let me come now to the, this other action uh, included in the... Uh, in the um, uh, era communication, which is the research assessment system. This is extremely important for us uh, because uh, for as long as uh, open science and, and open collaboration are not rewarded, uh, they will be taken up very slowly. So the action is that this year we launch a wide debate among uh, uh, policymakers and stakeholders with and coming to a concrete action beginning of next year. Next one, please. 
So this is not the first time that we uh, address this issue of research assessment. There has been already the Commission recommendation uh, to member states of uh, 2018 or already comments that member states and research institutions adjust the assessment of their research. Uh, we, it is a subject that has been longly discussed in the Open Science Policy Platform that operated for um, four years, from 2016 to 2020. Uh, and as I said, it's also part of the Commission communication of uh, last year. Next slide, please. So what is the problem with research assessment? In a nutshell, is that uh, we have the, 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 um, uh, the current system, which is dominant, it changes, it already has started changing, but still the dominant system is that the excellence is defined largely on the basis of where research is published. So this is the famous GIF, General Impact Factor, and um, that uh, so it's a reputation based economy in science where uh, if you really think about it it is a bit um, astonishing but still um, the um, where you publish is uh, more important than what you publish the content of what you publish uh, the uh, we need to go to a system where it's will have a more composite definition of excellence where many other aspects are taken into account um, the uh, the other uh, aspect of this is that um, uh, the researchers are mainly incentivized today to produce uh, publications, preferably in high GIF journals, and to publish as much as possible. Is this culture of publish or perish that we all know very well? Uh, we need to go towards a system that uh, also incentivizes researchers to share the knowledge, to share data they produced early and openly and to collaborate and be rewarded and be rewarded for that of course it's a very different situation depending on the discipline uh, we have different research cultures and the system needs to be adjusted to that we need a system also that is that is not purely quantitative uh, but we have uh, we use also qualitative as well as quantitative metrics and the system today uh, finally rewards mainly individual competing scientists uh, we need to find a way to reward teamwork and collaboration. Next one, please. So, uh, as I said, we are carrying out wide-ranging consultations. We had a meeting with uh, 110 stakeholders in mid-March. We are consulting the member states, we are consulting uh, universities, uh, research centers, uh, many other uh, stakeholders. We are intending to publish a green paper so say what we actually intend to do about October to November this year and come up with uh, uh, launch an action for reforming the system uh, beginning of next year under the French presidency of the, um, of the European Union. Next one. So uh, my, the last part of my talk uh, relates to uh, open science uh, under Horizon Europe. Uh, and I will uh, um, I will do it very shortly because uh, uh, I'm running out of time. Uh, so, since 2008, uh, we have introduced elements of open science in uh, in the framework programs. So the beginning it was open access to publications as a pilot. Then it became an obligation. Then we introduced open data as a pilot. Then it became the default, not the general obligation because the general uh, dictum is that uh, data and other outputs like software should be as open as possible, so open the default, but as closed as necessary, but this would need to be justified, there would need to be some valid reasons for this. Now in Horizon Europe, we are mainstreaming open science practices throughout the program. So from the drafting of proposals to proposal evaluation, uh, to the legal terms of the grant agreement to the guidelines we provide to our policy officers, project officers, and to projects, to reporting from the projects, and of course within the work programs themselves. So, the, um, for example, in the evaluation, the, um, the um, uh, uh, open science practices will be evaluated under the excellence criterion because open science, we said that it is, uh, has to do with a method, an approach of doing research therefore has to be evaluated under the methodology of a project. Uh, it, to some extent, it will be evaluated also under the implementation 
criterion of evaluation, which has to do with the consortium. Therefore, we look at CVs, I mean, the, our evaluators look at CVs, and therefore track records in sharing, in having a positive attitude and having uh, sharing your data, sharing your, um, your software, sharing your publications, so on with others, uh, will, be appreci will be appreciated will be a lot of attention to uh, research data management and will uh, have uh, will become much more uh, deep in uh, what we request from uh, data management plans that will be uh, an obligatory uh, deliverable of projects within six months and that elements of the data management aspects will be also evaluated as uh, part of the proposal. I have now uh, a few more slides which um, uh, uh, relate to uh, open data and open openness of other outputs, as well as research data management and FAIR outputs, uh, as well as to the open access obligations that in Horizon Europe that are, uh, are taken. Uh, next slide, please. And this is uh, the uh, probably the last slide I'll show. So open access to Horizon Europe um, takes a big step forward because now we have no more embargoes. Uh, so immediate open access. Uh, the all papers uh, or AAMs, author, uh, authorized manuscripts, uh, need to be deposited in a trusted repository immediately at the latest upon uh, publication. The authors need to retain sufficient intellectual property rights uh, so that they can open up their publications. We recommend open licenses like CC BY, uh, except for uh, books or long term format, long, long text formats, of which we allow also other licenses. Uh, they can publish where they want, uh, but under these conditions. And if they publish in a hybrid journals, which is quite a bit of journals, uh, they can do it if they want, of course, but we are not going to be reimbursing. Um, article processing charges because we uh, do not want to fund the existing subscription-based system and this perpetuates uh, the, um, the current uh, publishing system. The, the previous uh, presenter, I talked in quite some depth, I guess, about these issues. So uh, I think I can uh, stop here and uh, take up your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation, clear and precise. Uh, there are a few questions to you. Maybe I will read them and then give you the uh, time to answer, okay? Yeah. Uh, the authorities of our universities are reluctant to introduce institutional open access policies obliging academics to share publication and data in the open manner. Most often policies are loose recommendations. One of the arguments for introducing the so-called soft policies merely encourage open access in such that they not want and cannot force scientists to uh, practice open access. Another argument is that there is no national policy obliging university to implement institutional policies. How would you respond to these doubts of our rectors? Uh, are there any activities planned to do by the United, uh, by, by EU member states? Wait, let me scroll on the... Um, are there any activities planned to monitor EU member states regarding the level of introducing open access uh, to publication and data? Uh, could you comment, please? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, um, yes, that's that's this this a good uh, good point, good question. Um, so the um, uh, funders, we believe, have a very important role to play. So the uh, the the um, the universities. Uh, many universities are indeed uh, reluctant to mandate, to oblige all their staff, all their researchers to publish open access. Uh, the, um, the, there is the, the principle of scientific freedom and that you should be able to publish any way you want. A funder, however, has the right and the authority to say what is an eligible expense, where you know, he, she or he wants to spend their money. So we see this is why Coalition S is composed of funders. Uh, it is not composed of uh, institutions or uh, the um, or governments. So uh, the um, to the extent that um, I, and I'm not sure about this what the situation is in Poland with respect to your national funders, but um, to the extent that funders adopt such policies, then 
um, then the uh, open access movement will gain in momentum. It's already quite significant and has been progressing uh, over the years a lot, uh, but I, I think it will accelerate. Uh, the, um, uh, we do follow what the EU member states are doing. I talked very briefly in the beginning of my talk about the 2018 recommendation to member states. Uh, we we uh, have the obligation of following this up. So there were a number of recommendations, including on open access, and we have the national points of reference, including one for Poland, and we call them in a meeting every year, and we uh, where we discuss what the progress is across different member states, and we issue uh, a report. The last one was issued in uh, November or December 2020. Uh, I I am not uh, sure what the um, what the um, uh, what was the conclusion on Poland, uh, but this is what your government authorities reported to us as the situation of open access in Poland. Oh, man, many other things, but op including open access. I had a slide also in my presentation where I show the Polish numbers for open access, in um, which are not so bad. So if you look at how much is open access in Poland, uh, it's uh, it is um, it is, does not fare too bad the rips with respect to other member states. Uh, maybe you can show this uh, this uh, slide uh, later on. It is, however, uh, stopping in 2018. This is the more, 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 most recent data that uh, uh, I had available, but it shows the overall number of open access publications from 2012, I think, to 2018. So the the, the result the uh, so in the bottom line is that um, uh, we need uh, to uh, convince also institutions that they need to engage. We'll be doing this uh, through this, uh, the reforming the research assessment. We'll, we'll be taking these aspects of open access to account. But however, the funders have a very important role to play if we're talking about mandates, we're talking about obliging, uh, being mandatory something, uh, making open access mandatory. And we do follow and hold member states accountable uh, through the um, through the uh, uh, recommendation open science of 2018. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the second question is shorter. Is Open Research Europe intended only for articles or also for books? Um, it is uh, it is intended for both and many, several other things. So if you go to the website. There is a list of five or six different things. There are long, uh, long text formats. There are reports. There are um, there is, um, I believe, data sets. So they have, I think, six different types. In addition to articles, they have another four or five types of things you can publish there. Uh, the um, I see also the question here that uh, if they can be published in any language. Unfortunately, not in the beginning. So we start with English. And probably will stay English for um, the first um, the first couple of years, but it we have it in our in our radar to expand uh, later on. We cannot do it um, immediately, of course. Start uh, with a full, uh, full uh, uh, such a full breadth of languages and uh, and other services at the beginning. Okay, thank you very much. I will come back to this longer question comment. In fact, it's a little bit comment from the Polish. Uh, people who are under the process of evaluation, kind of specific for our, our Polish problems. The evaluation of universities and academics in Poland is based on points system, generally consisting in the fact that the most points are obtained for publication in the most prestigious journals. There is no system to motivate or reward scientists for publishing in the open model. Apart, apart, from, apart from the obvious, benefits of increasing the visibility and citation of our publication or data, we have no other tangible argument for publishing open access. This actually limits the interest in open model. Are there any systematic solutions plan that will be recommended to member states such as Poland in this respect? Over to you. Yes, yes, okay, that, that's exactly what, uh, this is fully correct, and that's exactly what I was talking about, that for as long as there is no, um, there are no uh, rewards, if if the um, open access or open science behavior is not incentivized, 
then the pro progress will be limited and uh, we need to change that now we uh, we cannot and we will not uh, uh, legally oblige anybody to do something of course uh, this is a consensual approach but it will be uh, it will be a, it will be a successful approach so it is something that uh, it's tackled with member states where poland participates for example there is the um, uh, era transition forum where poland participates there is erac in which these things are discussed with poland participates there is the council uh, of ministers where poland participates and which made recommendations in December, on the 4th of December 2020, made recommendations that include the, um, the, uh, the, uh, an encouragement to reform the way researchers and research institutions are being assessed. So th there, is, uh, there will be mounting pressure, not to Poland only, but there will be mounting pressure uh, everywhere for the system to change. And it will change. It will change. It takes time, but it will. Mm -hmm. Okay. We need your cooperation, however. We need your, the cooperation of everybody in order to be able to do that. True, true. Okay, I have the, another question. I mean, this is not a question, as I can see, this is more of a comment. Uh, in the context of European Open Science Cloud and COVID-19 related open science activities in Poland and EU, it is worth mentioning COVID-19 data portal and various infrastructure possibilities to support data sharing analysis tools, more on and so on. Uh, could you just definitely, say what, what yeah, definitely it? this is what i i mentioned at the beginning at the early part of my talk when i give you an example of data sharing through the covid-19 data platform or portal uh, and um, and i was i mentioned it um, in, a bit in a negative way because i said uh, we have encountered many problems of interoperability but uh, but in it is indeed a, a, a great success in the sense that uh, this uh, this data sharing platform was put together within 20 days it would have taken a project of three years in normal times <laughs> but due to the pandemic uh, people worked extremely quickly and day and night and uh, we will launch it already on the 20th of april and today it's used by um, I don't remember the exact numbers, but maybe 170 countries. So most countries around the world who have, um, who have uh, uh, 70,000 researchers of vaccines, genomics, and so on using the platform, who have um, half a million sequences, data, or yeah, I think something like this, half a million uh, um, sequences of the virus genome that are openly accessible on the platform. So it's a, it is indeed a great success. Okay, thank you very much. And the next question, uh, I'm familiar with it. We have uh, lots of data collecting for genomic data from medical purposes and the data increases exponentially. And the question here is, are there reasonable limits to open access to genomic data of research participants? Are there going to be, I guess, technical limits also? Um, I don't think there will be technical limits uh, because uh, I don't think the volume of information is such that will be prohibitive. Uh, I cannot have an authoritative answer to this, but I think if we compare about the, let's say, with astronomy and what the square kilometer array will produce, which is uh, exabytes per, per week or something like that, or if we compare to what... Uh, to what um, um the um, cryptocurrencies consumes consume in terms of data and electricity therefore uh, i think this is uh, this is not uh, this is not so significant uh, mm. it is significant but this is not uh, something that would stop uh, uh, open sharing okay but, uh, however there are issues related to personal data so if we are we're talking about the genome of people not of the virus or something else, but of people, then, of course, there are um, uh, personal data protection issues, but there are technical ways to address that. Yes, okay, thank you very much. Uh, there is a, uh, another question. Only the part of research teams are funded by National Science Center, the coalition has funded. Most of the researchers is funded by the university budget. So maybe the accessibility of some services will be not that easy. Uh, it means that uh, the um, 
what I said about um, about um, the funders having an important role to play in uh, putting the right conditions in terms of open science or open access, uh, it is um, in Poland. It's a bit different, if I understand correctly, the statement because. Uh, the majority is not competitive funding by funders, but it is funded. It's funded by the universities themselves. Is this uh, is this uh, right? I am not quite sure actually what the yeah. author okay. meant by these questions, but yeah. yeah, if if it's true, if it is this, if it is true the uh, the way I interpret it, then indeed uh, this makes it more important for Poland that the universities have also mandate a number of. Um, conditions in the uh, policies they have towards their staff. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I can see here on the chat window that uh, Dr. Anna Wałek said yes. Yes, it's true. So we believe the answer was accepted, yes, by the audience. Okay. Uh, we are exactly on time. I don't know, would you like to say something from my side? I would like to say that we are honored to have you here. It was really a pleasure to listen to your very precise, informative uh, presentation. So, enjoy well, it. Thank you for inviting me, and uh, I am willing. To my uh, my people also are always willing to uh, present. Uh, of course, I didn't have the time to present Horizon Europe in detail, uh, or I didn't present EOS, the European Open Science Cloud, at all, or several other things. So you um, uh, were always very willing to come and, uh, and uh, discuss with you. Thank you very much. I can see Rector Bishevsky. Przemek, over to you. <laughs> Thank you very much, I, Kostas and Krzysztof. That was very enjoyable. And I think that we are a step farther than after the last uh, lecture, because the question of openness is not only a publication, but open science as a part of social life. And I'm especially aware that in discusses about the openness of the science, well, focus is always on the science and humanities and culture is sometimes, well, back in minds maybe, but not as important as the scientific results of research. So I'm especially interested in the development of the project in those areas, but we will see, we will see. I, I cross my fingers that not only science, but also humanities and social sciences will be on your radar. Thank you very much, both of you. That was truly enjoyable. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>